Well, good morning, Green Pines family. We are so glad that you've chosen to worship with us this morning via this virtual experience. If you're a guest or a first-time visitor, we are extremely glad that you've chosen to tune in this morning as we worship through the singing of songs and then the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the word. And so we're going to go ahead and start our time off this morning with the singing of songs through praise and worship. And so we're going to start by singing Nothing But the Blood. Peace. 
patience would wait as we constantly roam. What Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more Stronger than darkness New every morn Our sins, they are many His mercy is more What riches of kindness he lavished on us His blood was the payment, his life was the cost We stood neath the dead we could never afford Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more Praise the Lord, his mercy is more than darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more we're going to sing that chorus praise the lord praise the lord his mercy is more darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more stronger than darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more Oh, His mercy is more, His mercy is more. Amen. I'm going to pray for us now. God, thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you this morning. We're so grateful and blessed to have access to this digital platform, Lord, to be able to present the gospel, present this church service online. I do pray for those that are joining in, joining in this morning that may be not members of Green Pines Baptist Church. They may not, they may have just stumbled across us this morning on Facebook or YouTube. Lord, we're so glad that they're here. We know that you have a word for each and every one of us. I pray now as we continue our time of worship through the preaching of your word, I pray that our pastor acts as a messenger of your good news the message that you've laid on his heart to share this morning. We ask all this in your wonderful name. Amen. Welcome to our Green Pines time together with you online, and um, hopefully some folks are able to make it to out on Sunday. We'll see looking at the weather, but if not, then certainly we have this option. And I uh, look forward just to be able to share the Word of God with you as we are continuing in Luke chapter 12, moving into Luke chapter 13. So if you want to, you can go ahead and Get your Bibles out and uh, turn to those passages as we uh, look, beginning at verse 54. Uh, as we've looked into this time, we've uh, studying Jesus, his mission. Uh, we looked at that in Luke 4 all the way through Luke 9, how Jesus accomplished his mission. And it was one of, of which he was looking for those who are captive and, and, and bring liberty to them, those who are blind, giving sight to them, those who are lame, uh, giving them strength to walk again, and, and basically going into the outcasts of society and proclaiming hey, you too can be a part of the kingdom of God. And, and you see example after example from Luke 4 through Luke 9, how Jesus was reaching the marginalized, those that were left out, and, and brought them center into the kingdom of God. Uh, and then at the end of chapter 9, uh, there, Luke takes a shift in direction of his writing with the idea of Jesus setting his face like a flint toward Jerusalem and headed toward the cross. And so from end of chapter 9 through chapter 19, is this making his way to Jerusalem, making his way to the cross. But as we study this, we look at what it means to follow 
this king who is writing a world that is drastically upside down. Uh, and so that is what we're headed toward. And in chapter 12, Jesus is bringing out this idea of his return. And what does that mean and how that produces a radical generosity uh, in the believer's life and our life. And as we look at our resources, and, and we looked at this last week again, and and the understanding that with this, there is going to become a division uh, where Jesus is going to judge the world and he will turn the world upside down, which means what you think about Jesus is the final divide over all things. And we looked at that understanding that either we will divide over Jesus and be united as a world together, or we will reject Jesus and live in multitude of divisions. Uh, and so a world that becomes more secular, a nation that is more secular, cannot help but allow smaller, insignificant things to come and bring division. Uh, and so I think that's kind of what we're seeing in America that's growing more and more secular uh, or um, kind of forcibly removing Christ from uh, the equation and policy uh, and direction. Uh, and so as we look at that, we're, we go to this passage in Luke chapter 12, and this is not a passage, especially as you move into chapter 13, we're going to look for verses 1 through 9. You're not going to see this on the wall anywhere. You're not going to see this on coffee cups. This is a passage that a lot of people just skip right over, and, but I can't help but think about this passage when tragedies happen, uh, because Jesus is being asked about tragedies and his response, and is a very what you might say uncharacteristic response that Jesus gives that you're not you're going to go to this passage thinking man I need some compassion I need some uh, some mercy some strength to help me through hard times um, but we'll see what it's about as we read and and what you've got here is a just Jesus saying the signs are everywhere uh, and we're going to look at that and, and Jesus in fact rebuking the people because they're not reading the signs that are everywhere. Uh, the other day, I was driving down uh, the 440 around the southern side of, of Raleigh, uh, headed toward Cary, and I just uh, noticed this billboard. I went by it a couple times. I couldn't help but kind of chuckle a little bit. But on this billboard was uh, a picture of a marijuana leaf. And then, uh, so that's what kind of grabs your attention. Uh, and on it, it said, here is your sign that you should not drive high. Um, and so you know, it's kind of one of those kind of clever things that we're kind of and yeah, we tend to say, hey, what's what's the sign? What's some of that mystic experience that leads me down the right direction? Someone kind of putting a play on that, saying, hey, well, hey, you, you want your sign? Here it is. Uh, don't drive high. Uh, and so I just want to bring to your attention that there are signs everywhere uh, around you today. And so with that thought in mind, I'm going to ask that you uh, read in the Bibles, uh, Luke chapter 12, um, beginning with verse 54. And he also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky. But why do you not know how to interpret the present time? I just want to stop for a second here and just give you this, this one point. I want to give you several uh, lessons about God and his dealings with us. First, I would say to you, reading this passage, that God is continually giving us signs. And he's giving us signs to repent. He's getting on the crowd here. The crowd involves his disciples. We know that his disciples are in the mix here. He's a, taught to them specifically within this. But there's also throngs of people around him. Uh, and so there's a large group. And there's also, yeah, this is a largely Jewish audience. This is a Jewish audience interested in God. Uh, this is a Jewish audience that perhaps probably have been generally good, especially as you count it relative to uh, the rest of the world. Uh, they have the law. Uh, they are trying to seek God. And so we're talking about a, a pretty good crowd for the most part. And yet G Jesus is saying to them, you know, you guys, you know how to read natural signs. And so he gives out the metaphor of when you see a cloud rising in the west, you just got to remember the Mediterranean was on the western side of the country. And so water uh, 
currents would come, our air filled with water would come from the west. As it hit the mountains, it rises and clouds form. He says, when you see that, you know rain's coming. Below Israel would have been the deserts. If you have wind coming from the south, then they know it's going to be a dry wind and it's going to be a scorcher. And he says, you know when this is coming, you can read the signs, but somehow you miss it on the most important things, those things about life and him. He says, you hypocrites, you know how to inter- interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? And what we read later on, he lets us know what he means is repentance here. Um, what are the signs of the time? Many people might be looking at today and thinking, man, there's so many signs of, of the end in this. We're, we're seeing believers walk away. Uh, we're seeing unrest. Uh, we're seeing sin, systemic, uh, just systemic within our government systems. Of course, we've got this a worldwide pandemic. You know, how many times in your life could you say that, that we're going through a worldwide pandemic, but that's exactly what we're doing? Uh, you know, but let me just share with you that all these things are signs, and they're signs that God is continually give us to repent. I was looking at the, the news this morning, and, and from when I looked at uh, the coronavirus is now nationwide at 112,000 deaths. Um, starting to rise above what the flu is. Uh, and doctor, I was meeting with the doctor uh, the other day, and he was saying, yeah, it's about 62,000. Uh, and so we're seeing that increase. Car deaths a year, 38,000 uh, that we have. Uh, suicides, 47,000 a year. Cancer, how many of you know someone that's have had cancer? There are 600,000 people a year that die of cancer, but the leading cause of death is heart disease at 650,000 people a year. Have you ever thought that every time you see someone die or hear a report of someone dying, it's God giving you a sign? Repent, repent. The signs are everywhere that God is continually putting out to us for you who have ears to hear and eyes to see. God is calling us all to repent. He's talking to the the good Jewish people, and he's telling them, God's giving you signs to repent. You keep on reading verse 57. Why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? As you go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and the officer put you in prison. I tell you, you will never get out until you've paid the very last penny. That's the smallest unit of measurement of their money. Um, it's interesting, this passage is given in Matthew, uh, and, and, and Matthew, it's more about getting things right with a brother. Uh, he's speaking in the Sermon on the Mount and saying this is in context of uh, don't be hateful toward others, uh, but instead settle with one another. But Luke takes that same uh, scripture, the same teaching, and, and applies it not just to a brother with a brother, but you with God. In this case, God is the magistrate. He is the accuser and the magistrate, and that we are being brought to the judge. We are being drugged to the judge with every age, every year, every gray hair, every weak muscle, every aching joint. We are being drugged to the accuser. And so he says, if you know that's the case, then make it right with your accuser. Make an effort to settle with them on the way. Because there is a judgment that is sure that is coming and coming faster than it was yesterday. God is continuing giving us signs to repent. But we'll keep on reading. We come to chapter 13. There were some present at the very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now, that is referring to something that happened that all the hearers would have known about. Um, We don't know exactly what it is, but we know that Pilate had demonstrated similar type of behavior. And this is Pilate's police force at work. They are abusing power significantly. What you have here is a civil atrocity that's happening. 
And all the Jews know about it. And evidently, uh, the, the, the Pilate's police force came upon a group that were uh, arising against him and came at to, on them in an unsuspecting time, in a time of worship, slaughtered them, killed them in such a way that their blood mingled with the sacrifices that were being offered at that time, which would have been especially abhorrent uh, to uh, someone watching in, in a Jewish sacrificial system to think that their blood was intermingled with the sacrifices. And, and they're asking themselves, is this some kind of sign that these people are worse than others because of the way of their demise? And so... Verse 2, he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then he he tells of another story in verse 4 and 5. Are those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed on them? And so this is a, a a natural tragedy. Uh, if, if the other is a civil atrocity, this is just a natural thing that happens. No, no way you can predict this thing, a, a tower falling, and, and this would have been in the, uh, I believe, the southeast section uh, around uh, Jerusalem, um, where this pool of Siloam was. There was a tower, and, and it fell um, on them. And then he says to them, um, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent you will all likewise perish. When we see the natural tragedies and we see the civil atrocities and the things that are happening, people that die, one of our natural uh, reactions is to watch this thing or to look at this, study it, read about it, and to figure out, could that have been me? And usually we like to walk away with the answer no (laughs) because we would never put ourselves in that position. By our superior thinking, uh, wise decisions, not going out at certain places at, at certain times, that we would say that would never happen to me because I'm not like that. And so that's one of our natural reactions to uh, civil atrocities as well as natural uh, disasters. That's one of the things that's most frightening is when we see these natural disasters, like, man, there's no way. That could have happened to anyone. And those are the most frightening things because there's no way we can control that. But, you know, you read this, um, and I, I just want to bring out something to you. God is continually giving us signs to repent, but also, secondly, God is asking all, the good and the bad, to repent. And the point of it he's bringing out is that these are not worse sinners. They're like you. He's asking the good and the bad to repent. When we look at the civil atrocity and, and, and bad things happening, when you consider the video uh, that was most recently done, did you put yourself in the place of the police officer? And you're asking yourself, well, I probably wouldn't be putting my hands in my pocket. I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't be. And you, you're trying to figure this out. Why or why not that person should have done it? Or did you put yourself in the victim who had the knee on their neck? And you ask yourself, well, they must have done something dumb. They must have done something wrong to produce that type of behavior. Did you place yourself there? Our our desire is like they must have done something wrong. Surely, Surely this type of behavior didn't happen without a cause. What if it did? Something for us to think about. But when we consider this, I I want you to think of a a quote from uh, a writer by the name of Miroslav Volf. He writes, Forgiveness flounders because I exclude the enemy from the community of humans, even as I exclude myself from the community of sinners. But no one can be in the presence of the God of the crucified Messiah for long without overcoming this double exclusion without transposing the enemy from the sphere of the monstrous into the sphere of the shared humanity and herself from the sphere of proud innocence to the sphere of common sinfulness. When one knows, as the cross demonstrates, that the torture will not eternally triumph over the victim, one is free to rediscover that person's humanity and imitate God's love for him. And when one knows, as the cross demonstrates, that God's love is greater than all sin, one is free to save oneself in the light of God's justice. And so to rediscover one's own sinfulness, 
the thought is, you know, a lot of times we look at this as a kind of a religious view of saying, if you live a good life, you'll have a good life. If you obey God, he'll bless you and he'll prosper you and answer your prayers. If things are always going wrong in your life and your prayers aren't being answered, it's because you must not be living right. You're being punished for some reason. There's something wrong with you. There's a reason why you get slaughtered and your blood gets mixed with the sacrifices. There's a reason why the tower falls on you. And it doesn't, that's not seem to be how Jesus responds to this. He wants them instead to say, hey, you need to repent. It's not that they're worse sinners than you, but if you don't repent, you'll also perish. The fact of the matter is, the tower needs to fall on all of us. Recently, I was uh, going somewhere, and uh, my morning routine um, was all messed up. I had to do some fasting before going to the doctor's office, and so I didn't eat breakfast, didn't have my coffee, didn't have my normal things. And, and so I, I go, and I go into the doctor's office, and it just seems like, man, something smells everywhere I go. I get out of the car. It's like, man, something smells. I, I walk into the building. It's like, man, why is this stench going on in here? I'm, I'm in the office, and it's like everywhere I go, the smell is there. But I knew there was no use of looking around to see whom's causing the smell or what's causing the smell. I didn't have to because I had a mask on. And I had a mask on, and I realized I didn't brush my teeth. And it's like, oh. The stench is within me. I can't go anywhere without just smelling this. Listen, what Jesus is getting us to do is get downwind of ourselves here. Realize the stench is right where you are. Let me just the the other tendency we tend to have it, you know, there's this the religious view of bad things. It must be because I've done some bad things, and consequently, if I do have good things, it's because I've done good things, and then we feel superior. Uh, one of the songs from The Sound of Music is the couple's falling in love, and they make this statement, from here you, for, for here you are standing there loving me, whether or not you should. So somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something good. Nothing comes from nothing, nothing ever could. So somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something good. This is that same religious moral teaching. You do good, therefore good things happen. It's the spiritual karma. Jesus is saying that's not how the world works. But the other tendency we have, especially in the natural tragedy, we think, okay, it's God that's unfair. Because these these are 18 people, that they're like me, and they just died. Well, that just doesn't seem fair. God, how can you do that? Let me just say to you, when when God created the world, he didn't create disease. He didn't create death. He didn't create war. He didn't create poverty. He didn't create injustices and inequities and, and oppression. No, these are the result of a world that's turned away from God and the brokenness that, brokenness that comes from that. And so when we see coronavirus, this is a world that's fallen from God. And so this is the result of it. When we see Oppression, when we see inequities, when we see abuse of power, when we see protests, we see riots, this is a world that we have created for ourselves. So let me just share you this other truth. God has continually given us signs to repent. God is asking all the good and the bad to repent. But also, this latest tragedy, it's not the expression of God's wrath. Notice how he answers this question. Is this because they're washed sinners? What does verse 5 say? No, I tell you. No. Verse 3, no. This isn't happening to judge their sin. I want you to think about your life for a little bit. Think of all the lives you've told and were never caught. Think of ways you distorted the truth and it never came out. Think about how you've hurt people. You've lost a friend because of the way you betrayed them. Every time you turned your back on God, did he turn his back on you? Point of this being is you haven't received merely a small percentage 
of the consequences that are due you. Your life isn't all the bad things, the sum total of all the consequences coming and, and judgment of wrath for your sin. The reason being, because it's not nearly enough. When God wanted to express his thoughts towards sin and judging sin, there's two ways, hell and the cross. Everything short of that is not God's wrath. It is a product of living in a world that systemically flew away from God, drives away from God, and all the consequences that come therein. Yes, God can use these things and is using these things to draw you back to him. He doesn't just use the bad things. I think about Romans chapter 2, verse 4. It says God's goodness leads us to repentance. The, the good things in life also is him drawing us to, to turn to him. So you need to understand the latest tragedy is not the expression of God's wrath. But notice, he doesn't stop there. He says, no. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This leads me to the next truth. The latest tragedy is not an expression of God's wrath. God's asking all the good and bad to repent. And the signs are continually everywhere to ask us to repent. But repentance is the common behavior of all who encounter God. You see, repentance isn't just turning from bad things. Remember, these are good people he's talking to. They're, these are the ones who are trying not to lie, uh, who are trying to honor God. It is, it's not asking uh, to turn from good things to bad things, but to turn from ourselves to him. Martin Luther, and the very first of the 95 theses that was nailed on the door, is simply this. Repentance is the continual behavior. Repentance is the continual life. All of life is repentance. And so that's what Jesus is saying here as well. Gospel repentance is saying this. It, it's, it's saying, I'm not living as if it's been paid. I'm, I'm trying not to earn my worth. I'm trying not to earn my significance and salvation with my performance and with good things. I'm, I'm looking instead at Jesus Christ to make him my hope. And so the gospel of repentance is turning from myself to Jesus for my life. It is the common behavior of all who encounter God. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. But here's one of my last things I want to tell you. And you see this in the last parable, verse 6. And he told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dressers, look, for three years now, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered them, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put it on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. My last observation to you from reading this text is that today is not too late for repentance. In this story, the fig tree historically has represented Israel. Today it represents the believer. It represents you, a human soul, the fig tree. Notice this fig tree has been three years since it hasn't bared fruit. Fig trees bear yearly. For it to go three years is unusually long time for a tree not to produce fruit. In this, the man who owns the tree is God. And he's looking at his vineyard where the fig trees are in with the grapes. And he's saying, it's my, I, I expect fruit from this. The gardener, is Jesus. The gardener is saying, I know they should be cut down. They've lived a long life and they've not repented. But give me a year. Let me dig around it. Expose the roots to the moisture and water. Let's put fertilizer and manure around. Let's provide everything needed for repentance for fruit and see if fruit comes and notice what he says verse 9 then if it should bear fruit next year well and good 
Here's what I'm saying to you. I think Jesus is bringing this out. You have lived a life selfish. You blame God for all the things that you think you ought to get and don't get. You blame God for the bad things that happen in your life, never thinking about the good things that he's given. You've lived life for yourself. You see, you tend to orient everyone around you according to who you are and what you want to accomplish. Jesus knows this about this, about you. you. You breathe his air with the heart that he's made for you. And you live in the time that he's given to you. And you've lived your life and you continually live it in such a way as to treat God as nothing. Despite that, Jesus is saying to you, if you will repent, it will be well and good. There's still time. There's still opportunity for you to bear fruit. The bearing fruit is this repentance of turning to God. God is looking in the life that you, the fact that you live today in 2020 and all of its craziness, God knew you would live in this day and time and he's looking to you to turn to him in the midst of all of what's happening. And that's what he desires. And these are signs pointing to it. It doesn't matter how long you've lived or how much you've worked against God. God is saying, if you'll turn to me now, it will be well and good. Because the only one who was truly just, who was truly right in every way, lived in this world and this world and justly slaughtered him and his blood became the sacrifice. Jesus was the one in which the tower of God's wrath fell and it was done for you. Would you take God and say, I'm sorry, forgive me. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me and I turn to you now. If that's where you are, I'd love to know about it. You can contact our church office. Um, You can send a message. We'd love to be able to help you and encourage you on what it means to repent in this day and time. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this message and what it means to me that I continually am to live in a life of repentance, that we never outgrow that, Lord. And I thank you that it's not too late and that you're working in our life to expose us to the, the waters of life and, and to bring fertilizer in our life, Lord, to prepare us for repentance and turning to you. God, thank you that you're drawing us to yourself. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, congregation, we're going to enter our time of response now to the message that we've just heard. We are going to be singing a familiar tune, Lord, I Need You. Um, it's perfect in this scenario and many others to be able to respond to what God is teaching us, to be able to respond to how he's moving in our hearts and our lives. And so, you know, repentance is the main theme of of this Sunday, um, as it should be pretty much every day of our life, every day of our life. Um, We need Jesus. We're singing that now, Lord, I need you. And so in this time, this tune is going to be a little bit different than normal. Um, This is going to be a different rendition of this song. If you're able to catch on, please feel free to sing along. But I really do encourage you during this time to just enter a time of prayer, a time of repentance into the Lord. Take some time with just you and him personally. And I'll be singing these wonderful words about how much we need him. He's our one defense, our righteousness, and how every hour, not just some, but every hour and every minute of every day we do need him. So take some time in repentance. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Oh, every hour I need you. My one defense.
heavens my righteousness oh god how i need you where sin runs deep your grace is more where grace is found Oh, is where you are And where you are Oh, Lord, I am free And holiness Is Christ in me Where you are And where you are Lord, I am free and holiness Is Christ in me Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. And every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. for us. God, we do need you every moment of every day. Lord, we are sinners in need of a Savior. And Lord, you have saved us, those of us that you call children, those of us that have placed our faith and trust in you. You are saving us and you will save us, Lord. I pray in the moments of the day, each and every day, that we look towards you, your will for our lives, and in our struggles and in our battles with temptation, Lord, that we call on you. We call on the power of the Spirit to work in and through our lives so that we can shine your light into this dark world. We ask all this in the wonderful name of Christ. Amen. Green Pines family, you're sent.